Welcome to First But Last, brought to you by the Wyoming Humanities. I am your host, Emmy DeGrappa. Wyoming is called the Equality State because we were the first to give women the right to vote. 150 years later, we wonder what Wyoming women think about their progress toward equality now. Let's find out, and thank you for listening. Today, we are talking to Clearing Law. Clearing has been a community member of Jackson Hole since when, Clearing? When did you 1959. Wow. You moved here in 1959. What was your journey to get to Jackson? Well, I'm a school teacher's wife, and where we're sitting here was the old high school. I remember that journey of walking down the sidewalk with a little four-year-old and into that old building. And at that time, I went to work at the school also. Oh, you did? Okay. And Jackson High School was not accredited. It was Jackson Wilson High School without accreditation. And so someone had some skills in typing, things like that. And anyway, I helped with the paperwork for that. Well, since then, you've traveled a long road. You've been a state legislature, in the state legislature. You've started a hotel chain here in Jackson. Tell me about that journey. Well, you know, it isn't a journey that I ever envisioned for myself. I went very little to college, and I was going to be a pharmacist, but we moved up here, and the opportunity was not there. The skills that I had were just rudimentary, gained through high school. And I uh, had uh, opportunity, the Wirt Hotel was being sold, and John and Jess Wirt needed somebody to type a contract. There were no attorneys here, not Mr. Moody was an attorney. And they brought in Mr. Spaulding from Evanston, Wyoming. And I typed the contracts when they sold to Teton Motor Hotels Management. Then they said, our bookkeeper quit. Would you be our bookkeeper? After I'd done their inventories, I had a little stint of being a bookkeeper at the Wirt Hotel. There was a man named Moy Nethercott who owned the original antler, which was 12 rooms and the original part that's still there. There was an old log cabin that had been built over, and that's still the center of the Antler Motel in Jackson. More proper to call the Antler Inn in modern language. But it was a bad day, and by then I had Sharice, who was a year and a half old. We lived up on the hill by the cemetery, and they didn't plow the roads very good. It was February. I had walked down that hill, carrying that baby to a babysitter, Walked into the Wirt Hotel, where the requirements of the job are pretty stiff because you also were the assistant manager. And in walked Mr. Nethercott, said, I'm going to put her on the block, meaning the antler. And I took a gulp and said, uh, let me try. And with the help of my parents, who are blue-collar workers, and what little money we'd saved, Franklin Meadows and I, but the first string of cabins, which is where the Antler is today. That is an amazing story. So you really financed it yourself or with the help of your family. And then from there, you just grew it. So now it's four different properties, isn't it? Yes, and, and a couple of small ones. We had opportunity in those times. You know, the town was growing. And anybody willing to work hard could grow with the town. Right. So your daughter, Sharice, did she go to work with you every day? Did She did. You know, that's one thing. You know, my, my, my little daughter by then was five, my oldest one, and she had sore throats, and I'd take her to work at the work. And one thing that disheartened me, because we had a very fussy manager, and he really didn't think it was very proper to bring a child and put him in a room so he could watch him. And, uh, you know, I, I was a little disheartened with that. And then the babysitter and, and little Sharice was, you know, under two years old. And yes, it gave me an opportunity to raise a family and work. Very few women have that wonderful opportunity. Right. And Mm -hmm. so what was your desire to run for the state legislature? Well, you know, you know, along the road I was divorced and then I married again. And I married somebody that worked with me. And so it it, it was a good life and I had a lot of support is where I'm coming. You have to have the support to do those things. Well, along the road, I had served on a lot of committees here in town. I was on the first zoning commission, and people didn't want zoning here, but we had to have zoning here. And I uh, had been on the school board three years as chair, 
and I had this experience behind me, and I didn't realize the partisanship. And so I would get my name written in for the ballot each year, and the Secretary of State would call me and said, you have enough signatures, I think it was very few, would you like to be on the ballot to run for the legislature? And I'd say, heavens no. I've got the children to raise and build. And I don't know, one time, you know, I'd been going to a few political meetings by then, and Grant Larson, I had not gone to one, and H.L. Jensen, wonderful friend of mine, Democrat, legislator, I didn't realize he was retiring. And so uh, Grant had uh, gone to this meeting, and he said, uh, Clarine said that she would maybe run. And so they brought me chicken soup. I thought about it, talked to my family, and we got in the game. Wow. And how long did you serve? 14 years. And from, from the time you served for 14 years until now, what has changed in the legislature that that you see that is significantly different or the Two same? things. Okay. Protocol and respect. I think that their protocol is absolutely necessary in respecting the process and civility and respect for each other. I think it's a lessening of that. Respect for both parties. Right, because you had friends who were... I'm obviously a centrist, okay. <laughs> You're a centrist, okay. <laughs> I uh, I believe in people and issues. And what have been, what were the issues that you really believed in then, and and still do believe in now? Well, some of the best legislation in which I was involved had to do with the, uh, like the learning center and uh, the uh, the free clinic, frankly, that we established, which gave some immunity to doctors so they could give the helping hand when they were retired, for instance. And then uh, some legislation was Medicaid match for traumatic brain injury for adults and things like that. I was always really interested in the economic platform, of course. And I did chair as chairman of minerals, business, and economic development. And uh, those were very, very something where I could contribute. And they, they were important issues to me, but the theater was always important. I was the instigator, along with Hank Coe of Cody of the Cultural Trust. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. We wrote the law. We pushed the law. And I quit in 2004, and they passed the law. They did not fund the law until 2005. But it's done so much good. And I'm so proud of the Cultural Trust, as is Hank. What intrigues you the most about living in Wyoming? The people. The people? (laughs) The people. You know, I've had a job where I could interact with all Wyoming Sometimes my husband thinks I know all 500,000 because they march in and they say, do you remember when? And I say, yeah, I'd, and um, I knew your grandmother. And, you know, age has some some wonderful rewards. I read that you really have a passion for immigration reform. Why is that? I do have. There's no doubt about that. I hugged a boy just if I came over here, came in here at the problem. Well, you know, we need those people here. Culturally, we need those people here for jobs. And the recognition should be made that there are such people of great value. My head housekeeper at the Antler, for instance, is was an H2B and struggled through to a green card. And we've achieved, as a family, several green cards by sponsoring people. And they make it so hard. It would be so much better to have less illegal and less undocumented, if they simply made immigration properly secured with clearance easier. Mm -hmm. We still work with the H-2B program and the green cards, and I love those people like family. So as as a woman in Wyoming and working in the legislature and just coming to Jackson since, what did you say, 1959? 1959. I bought, our family bought the Antler in 1962, May 7th. Okay. So what do you think the challenges are as we enter into the 150th anniversary of women's suffrage and and celebrate the fact that Wyoming was the first state to give women the right to vote? What do you think the challenges have been for women in our state? I think it's hard. I think that, you know, the the issue of wage parity is something that's very difficult to overcome. I'm such a big proponent of equal pay for equal job. 
And, and th there is a difference. You're probably not going to go down to hard rock mining, although whatever. But it, that, that's very important. But there are challenges and there's less opportunity as, as the state grows. And there is less opportunity. And so I, I see that I came at a time when opportunity was great. And I want to see that, that continues. For instance, in this valley, you know, the acquisition of property is almost impossible. And I, I think there are challenges. Right. So if you had moved here now versus mm -hmm. years and years ago, could you see yourself owning property in Jackson? I couldn't own property in Jackson. There's no way. We have a phony society. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, it's not right that people that just work normal middle-class jobs can't acquire a home. And, you know, with the requirements are so great for the workforce. And, and like I heard of another motel today that has gone into housing. And, you know, we are a tourist community. And much of the workforce is based on that. But we should be able to do a little better job of housing. And, and of course, I think that the tax thing is wrong, too, for the Teton County. And State Board of Legalization needs to be challenged. I think a lot of things. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I don't know that I could do the things. I know I could not. That's what I know. And I worry about it for my grandchildren. Well, in terms of, you know, not Jackson, but the rest of Wyoming, how can we mentor young women? I mean, I think it's hard because, you know, we want our young people to stay here and work here. But if there's not jobs here, then that's a challenge. Or if they can't buy a home, that's a challenge, even anywhere in Wyoming. Well, as a businesswoman, I can let them progress within an organization. I can be a positive influence in their life. They need to surround themselves with positive influences. Women can do that for other women. You know, everybody wants to be at the top of the mountain, but you don't get there all at once, and you don't get there alone. You know, your strengths are developed on the way up, your perseverance. But you have to know that someone cast you a rope along the way. My kids cast me a rope. My husband's cast me a rope to help pull me up. And public service opportunities that are here, they're still here. You serve, and those ropes come to you. And as you accept those ropes and crawl up that mountain, you develop something called self-confidence. So I want to be somebody that can be that rope. And I think that's what women can do to help others, is, is show them that it's possible in a difficult environment, provide that positive environment for young women. Provide a positive environment for young women? Yes. How many women were serving in, in the state legislature when you were there? Well, in the House, there were 17. But I don't know how many there are today. I was going to ask. I know there are five. I believe it's five women in the Senate. Daffy's one of them. I think it's, been, it's less. They lost some seats this past election. Yeah. It's too bad. Well, they have a difficult time because those ropes that I talk about, my family— had they not been willing to step aside while I did those things and to provide the support I needed, we would not have been able to serve. That's another reason I'm so proud of Affy and some other young women there. They are able to raise their children and still serve. But geographically, when you think of 537 miles from your front door, it's difficult. Right. My children came home from college and stayed in the family business so that I could serve. Wow. And my husband stayed here, and my mother, who was a great influence in my life, was handicapped. She had, had a stroke. And my husband stayed here mostly and took care of her. So have those been your greatest influences in your life? Well, my mom <coughs> taught me to work, and she also taught me about self-esteem because I had very little. I was a little road construction kid. We moved, and my parents thought it was more important to be together. And so we had a 8 by 20 foot little house dad built, and there were four children, and we traveled, and I went to 21 school changes by the time I got to high school. Wow, that's incredible, and, Clearing. And it was a challenge every time, and my mother would clean us up and get us down to that country school or whatever school it was and say, you're just as good as anybody else, and then in our spare time, she had us practicing spelling and arithmetic and reading stories like Heidi. Oh, that's great. My mom was a great strength in my life. 
Oh, that is really beautiful. And I bet your granddaughters are looking up to you in that same way. And you're I hope so. I have very strong granddaughters. You know, you know, I'm so proud of all these kids. You know, Madison Haas, who's been involved with the arts and with her degree from BYU, and then my oldest granddaughter, Natalie Meadows Eggleston, has is just graduated from med school, accepted a an internship in with Stanford and for her residency. And I have kids now graduating, Griffin Jilson, and these kids are graduating from from college now. And uh, I want them to have, I want to be a rope for them too. But mainly it's not so much as a financial rope. It's a rope to help pull them up of my positive thinking. And I want them to, I want them to know how I think. Right. And you need to sit down and just spend lots of time talking to them. I try to do that and feed goldfish. (laughs) <laughs> you feed goldfish. <laughs> how are you? How are you passing on your legacy to to your children and your grandchildren? My children, my daughters, have worked with me a lot. I mean, in fact, the poor things—they were doing desk clerk and cleaning rooms until they had law degrees and PhDs, and they said, "Well, Mom, I can do something other than this." And you know, they—I uh, think I have some failures there with my busyness, but I'm passing on through my work ethic. And also my belief in myself, and I want them to believe in themselves, because I think I was taught by my mother that I could do it. I think that's excellent. And I thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you for listening to First But Last, brought to you by the Wyoming Humanities. Please join us again next week as we continue our conversations with women from around the state. You can also find us at thinkwhy.org where we continue the conversation on our blog about the history, journey, and the challenges of Wyoming's intrepid women living in the Equality State. And if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show and leave us a review on iTunes. Thank you for listening. Thank you.